Hi there, it's Steve Donahoe from Angelic Ministries, and uh, I want to re uh, have a read a word of God to you about how we have all been Gentiles before, and before we weren't actually going to be saved, we were not really under the law of the Jews even, we were outcasts, and in order for us to actually be saved, we had to live by the rules of the Jews or become circumcised by them to live with them and follow all the rules and regulations that God gave them and really that was the only way that we could actually be not even really true of ourselves to know that if we've actually um, outweighed our good deeds to our bad deeds until Jesus Christ was put in place on the cross for that now <sighs> You need to read the word properly to understand what it means. And I am not going to read the word myself, but I'm going to read the word through the Bible as stipulated of someone that's actually teaching and for you to listen to what the actual word does say that we are, apart from the law of sin and death, now that we're with Jesus Christ. So, about being no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ, that we've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, but there are, there are conditions for it. So I want you to just listen to this in, in Romans 8, 9 and 10, that you're going to hear the word of God and what it needs to be said. So please listen to what it says, because this is in the Word of God. By no means am I changing anything. This is in the ASV edition. But in order to really understand what is it about being Jesus Christ and about having to be dead with Jesus Christ, that we have to live according to the rules of Jesus Christ. So please listen. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, 
provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay, it said, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. What that means is once we receive the Holy Spirit inside of us, oh. And again, there's a condition to be met, which I'll talk about later. But likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In other words, it helps us when we are in a position of weakness and when Satan is trying to attack us, that the Holy Spirit has been in, pl in place for two reasons. Number one, when we get the Holy Spirit put inside us, it is to convict us of our wrongdoings, but to give us strength and guide us for when we do wrong. You read the rest of this, you'll hear. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now what that means is that we can't pray for ourselves sometimes, but the Holy Spirit, and this is when they talk about in tongues, there's a Holy Spirit that actually intercedes for us that we can actually pray for what we know and understand. So we pray in the Spirit of the Holy Spirit that has given us of tongues, which is an actual communication between us and God. So he will hear our prayers. For we don't know what to pray for at that particular time, but the actual Holy Spirit of tongues allows us to pray to God so he can understand. And not only can he understand, but the devil cannot actually interpret to what we say. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Okay, now this part here is the, the process of... The Calvinist. The Calvinist approach was to say that there were predestined people that were going to go to heaven and predestined people that were going to hell. And this is one of the verses that they actually use on it. And it's been taken out of context. Now, it's not to say that everybody, because if you read earlier on, it says that everybody that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It isn't up to a certain people that are that are ordained and the elect that will be going to heaven accordingly to predetermined people that were actually going to go to heaven and predetermined that are going to go to hell. And that is not true. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those whom he predestined he also called, and those whom he called he also justified, and those whom he justified he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, 
or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what it's saying, once you've accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, that we have all these things that are for us and not against us. And as long as we continue to believe and to be dead in ourselves, and now alive in Christ, that we live for Christ, and we live for his commandments that he has given us to live in righteousness. But also there are warnings to be said in regards to this. And uh, we're going to go through these passages of Romans 8 that are very, very important, but you need to understand what it's all about. So we're going to continue on to go to the next passage. Chapter 9 I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, The older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, Okay, and in regard to that, you'll hear in Scripture that he said that he has mercy unto whomever he wills. And he also hardens whoever, whoever he wills. He actually hardens people's hearts so they cannot turn back to God because he knows that they never will. So he hardens those hearts that he knows that they cannot turn back to God. It's not that he wants to do that. He just knows they will never turn back to him. He will never. They will never repent to him and he turns their hearts hardened because of it. So they're really separated from God, and they're the ones that have denied, um, continue to deny Jesus Christ, and continue to, to deny what God has given. So they're lost. I'm sorry to say they're totally lost. They they cannot come back, and, and this is what God is trying to say. But he also shows mercy, and this is one I want to show to other people, that he shows mercy unto whomever he wills. So... Sometimes he puts people in place that you don't expect him to actually use. But he's used many in the Bible for the good to be worked out because he works all bad out for good. And he specifically says that. 
So when these people say to you, uh, why is God merciful to others and, and hardens others' hearts and denies them, it's not that God denies them, it's that they deny God. So this verse is showing you and, and what he says about the, the potter's clay is something that you need to, to listen to and to really understand the, the compassion of God and, and the reasoning of God, okay? Because uh, many people say to it, well, if he was a loving God, why did he, did he create sin in the first place? It's not that he created sin in the first place. There was rebellion in the kingdom of heaven. There was pride. When he threw Lucifer down from heaven, that pride became sin, and it literally grew and grew and grew because of hate and resentment towards God. So when there's hate and resentment towards God, something else is actually born, which is born of sin and evil and corruption and all those sort of things. It fed that. It's not that God created that. It was fed because of rebellion against Satan, which he was an angel, Lucifer, of light. But he rebelled against God. He wanted to be more like God. And he took a third of his angels with him to rebel against God. There was a fight in heaven. They were thrown down. And they were told that they could rule earth. So God cannot allow sin in the heaven. Okay? Actually, pride. Understand? Pride. It was pride at first. He couldn't even allow pride into the kingdom of heaven. So he had to throw it down, and pride actually gave birth to sin. Because pride is just, like I always say, it's kind of like under the skin. Pride is underneath there. The skin, sin is shown as the skin, but underneath is pride. And you don't see pride, but it, it bears sin, okay? It gives growth to sin, so you've got to be very, very careful about your pride. So let's just continue on this. And he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, Those who were not my people I will call my people, and her who was not beloved I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, If the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So we're talking about here that they didn't live by the rules because they didn't have faith. The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is righteousness, that is by faith. Now, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. They pursued it based on works. Now, this works 
is also taken out of uh, context as well. There were works of the flesh. Understand, there was only one way for them to be saved at that time, and they had to continue to go to the priests and have their sins forgiven by the act of the rituals that the priests actually had to do the sacrifices in order for the whole tribe of Israel to be forgiven. And for each person that actually had to have their sins forgiven, they had to give an actual um, sacrifice of atonement. And whenever they sinned wrongly, they had to continue to do that. So it was like work. They had to continue to, to in order for them to 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 be accepted by God, they had to continue to humble themselves and give themselves as sacrifices or they had to take to the altar a sacrifice to cover their sin. And Jesus Christ, because he was put on the cross. And that was the the work of Christ, okay? The work of Christ was he to be put on that cross to bear all our sins upon himself, to take it to hell, to throw it there. And to say it is finished, that because of what we have done, that Christ has shed his blood for us so we don't have to go to the high priest and have to have a sacrifice done each time just to cover our sins. Jesus Christ did that for us once and for all. So by what he did on the cross and shedding his blood, he has taken all that sin upon himself as a former man at that time. And that's why he says, why, God, have you forsaken me? When the time comes, it's because he's a man. And now he is feeling all sin, all sin upon himself at that time of how we felt. Everything piled upon us at that time. And he felt that to that point of his death. And when he went to hell and he took it and he took the mm -hmm. fight and he took the fight with, took that fight with, to hell so we don't have to go there to spend eternity with him in heaven but there's a condition again to to be met on and this is going to be my first lesson right now in regards to that being a gentile that we are saved by the blood of jesus christ that we are surely saved at that period of time but the next people that um believe that we are totally saved for eternity is another doctrine that is not totally right and I'm going to lovingly convict them for it and not condemn them for it as I've been doing lately but we get misled sometimes and there's certain verses that I will use to say that you have eternal security in Jesus Christ, which is true. Once we accept Jesus Christ in our hearts, we are saved. There's no doubt about that. We are saved. But there's there's a saved when we accept Jesus Christ. There's a saved in walking in our lives for Jesus Christ. And there is a saved for eternally living with Christ. And it's a process. So this is my first lesson right now that I'm not going to worry about literally showing my face, giving the word of God. You can hear what I say, but you can hear the actually, the real word of God speaking to you as well. I'm just here to support brothers and sisters in Christ as well and give them direction that when they are struggling... But if you need direction, you need to hear the real word of God to be directed by him, to be strengthened by him, and to be guided by him. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this. Thank you, and may you continue to hear the next lesson. Thank you.